Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Euractiv uh, virtual conference, Central Asia, South Asia Connectivity Summit, why it matters to the region and beyond. My name is Georgi Gotov. I'm a journalist uh, at Euractiv. Um, I cover a lot Central Asia. It's a fascinating region. But why are we gathered? An international uh, connectivity high-level event uh, named the Central and South Asia Regional Connectivity Challenges and Opportunities will take place in Tashkent on 15, 16 July as an initiative of the President uh, of Uzbekistan, uh, Shavkat Mirziyoyev. This is an initiative uh, which uh, uh, deserves our attention and I'm sure this debate uh, will be a very useful curtain raiser. Uh, what is Central Asia and South Asia? You know, we journalists, we all always try to uh, simplify. Obviously, these are two huge regions uh, that have been separate uh, for a very long time. Uh, let's keep in mind that Central Asia uh, is in fact uh, five former uh, Soviet uh, republics. So the connectivity between these two mega regions is, is, uh, is not good. And uh, uh, that's precisely the aim of this summit. Uh, it's a gathering of leaders uh, from both regions uh, aiming to increase connectivity. Uh, the summit will have three uh, main themes of uh, discussion, uh, economy, security, culture. It's uh, amazing that uh, India and Pakistan, uh, two countries that have developed uh, nuclear weapons to to be able to fight against uh, each other will be present. Uh, I saw in the press that the Prime Minister of Pakistan himself is, is going to, to Tashkent, but also leading representatives of Russia, Iran, China, the United States and the EU will also be invited uh, to the summit. Uh, my journalist uh, sources tell me many names, uh, but we'll return to, to this uh, uh, later. Uh, we live in uh, challenging times. Uh, last uh, April, uh, there was a border clash between Tajikistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the issue was uh, very much against the background of uh, uh, access to water resources and uh, uh, not uh, proper border uh, delimitation. Uh, and these are, of course, two issues that uh, will probably uh, be, be discussed uh, more and more um, in the future in the format of regional cooperation. And a couple of days ago, uh, Tajikistan called up uh, reservists to bolster its, uh, its border with Afghanistan out of uh, security concerns and refugees uh, coming uh, following the departure of the Western military forces from Afghanistan. Afghanistan is an important country and uh, I also understand that it will be uh, represented uh, by, by its, its president at, at the summit. Um, we have um, uh, a great list of uh, panelists. Uh, we have um, uh, from uh, uh, the European External Action Service, uh, Philip van Amersfoort, uh, Deputy Head of uh, Central Asia Division. Uh, also from uh, EAS, uh, we have Romana Vlahutin, um, Ambassador at Large for uh, Connectivity. Uh, we have uh, uh, an important representative of the European Parliament, uh, MEP Richard Czarnecki. Um, uh, he's a Polish MEP who chairs uh, the EU-Russia uh, uh, delegation. Uh, we have uh, Stefania Benalia, associate researcher with uh, SEPS, uh, uh, the well-known uh, Brussels uh, think tank. Uh, uh, we have with us uh, Stefan Fule, uh, former European Commissioner for Enlargement, uh, uh, who is now a um, consultant of the President of um, uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Obid Hakimov, uh, Deputy Advisor of the President of Uzbekistan, uh, Director of the Center of uh, Economic Research and Reforms um, uh, in Tashkent. I will be extremely stern in limiting the initial statements to five minutes. Um, the initial statements by panelists, five minutes each, please. And uh, I invite uh, the audience to send questions uh, using uh, the chat. Um, 
indicating uh, who, who they are and to whom they are asking uh, the question. Uh, and I'm also uh, inviting uh, those uh, from the audience uh, planning to go to Tashkent uh, for the conference to identify themselves and perhaps tell us uh, uh, what uh, what will uh, what do they expect from from this conference where, where they're going there. So without further ado, uh, I will give the floor uh, for a welcome uh, statement uh, to uh, Dilior Hakimov, uh, the ambassador of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, to Belgium, um, uh, who is also the head of mission of Uzbekistan to the EU and uh, NATO. Uh, Dilior Zafarovic, uh, you have the floor. Very good morning, everybody. Uh, dear Georgi, dear panelists, dear audience, all the friends and colleagues of this embassy, but most importantly of Uzbekistan, everybody in this room, including those uh, are going to participate in actual conference July 15, 16th in uh, in Tashkent. Very good morning, and uh, I would like once again uh, to congratulate your active to following so closely developments in Central Asia, particularly in Uzbekistan. As you know, this year uh, Uzbekistan, as well as many other post-Soviet uh, space countries, including the Central Asian states, are going to celebrate. But um, Remarkable jubilee is 30 years of our independence. So there is no mistake that uh, there is time to uh, recollect what the countries, particularly Uzbekistan, uh, have achieved uh, as achieved uh, during these uh, times. It would be no mistake also to say that uh, for the last years under the strong leadership of uh, His Excellency uh, Shavkat Mirziyev, President of Uzbekistan. Our country has made, uh, has made a breakthrough in its regional policy. The issues of water use delimitation that was already uh, mentioned in the welcoming uh, remarks of Georgi, and demarcation of state borders between Uzbekistan and neighboring countries, the use of transport communications and uh, border crossing have been resolved. Uzbekistan has significantly intensified its participation in peace building in Afghanistan. And the president of Uzbekistan pays special attention threatening the intensification of works of creation of trans afghan corridors. Uh, just uh, to remind that uh, first ever uh, conference uh, of the re regional and international nature of this participation from Afghanistan on the highest level taking the place in November 2017. It was quite successfully followed by the Tashkent conference March 2018 after Three years, uh, Uzbekistan again became becoming the capital of international affairs, and this uh, upcoming conference is, it will be marked uh, by many uh, new ideas. We are sure so, and also by uh, some uh, important decisions. Uh, by all means, I would like ask everybody in this room to openly discuss and uh, provide the ideas. It should also help us. Uh, to formate and put additional ideas for the for the engagement and cooperation. So, uh, without any further ado, once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this very important conference. Thank you, thank you, Dior. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, so let's kick up uh, our discussion uh, with uh, uh, Romana Blahutin uh, from uh, the External uh, Action uh, Service, Ambassador at Large uh, for uh, Connectivity. Uh, Romana Blahutin, uh, the floor is yours. We we cannot hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I am here. Do you hear me? Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot, and and it's it's a great pleasure to to be uh, uh, together with colleagues on this panel. Um, let me try to do uh, two things briefly uh, within these five minutes. First, explain very briefly what we are doing on connectivity in the EU, and and how uh, it links to the discussion of today, and the expectations from the conference. Um, in the EU, of course, connectivity has always been done. You can say that European Union is a product of connectivity, but we are now taking it to uh, to the next generation of, 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 of working on it in a way. 
uh, we are looking at connectivity in a very focused and joined up way together regulatory aspects and physical projects. Um, European Union has plenty of experience to share uh, on how to grow through managed interdependence that connectivity is. Uh, there are two basic fundamental principles. Um, sustainability, be it social, uh, environmental, fiscal sustainability and the level playing field. At the moment, we are working on robust council conclusions that will come out very soon to, uh, again, extend step up uh, the existing connecting EU Asia strategy. We have agreed partnerships with Japan and India, where again, uh, Central Asia uh, is mentioned and plays an important role. And also we are discussing it within the G7 and G20 formats. Uh, for the European Union Central Asia relations, this has great importance. Let me just throw a few, few numbers here. European Union is a top trading partner for Central Asia, 24% um, uh, above uh, both Russia and, and China. Um, FDI, European FDIs uh, are 40% of total FDIs in Central Asia and um, European Union and its member states have provided in the last decade more than 1 billion euros in development assistance. Uh, we have invested, of course, in infrastructure, but also massively at the regulatory systems, uh, in, in customs, in trade facilitation, in, in energy market. Maybe Philippe will give you some more details about it. Uh, and, and therefore, I, I really think that the conference that we, uh, we will be joining in, in Tashkent next week is extremely important for, for three reasons. Um, First, I think it's very important that the region itself shows this great ambition and um, the regional approach is essential. Uh, there is no uh, way to move on connectivity without an understanding and a common understanding on harmonization and, and, and sustainability as essential elements of this um, to be built on common rules, common norms, so that partners are predictable to each other and to the external uh, investors. There are estimates, um, and, and the figures are from the Asian Development Bank, that the total infrastructure needs in Central Asia are around 450 billion euros until 2030, 20, uh, that there is an investment gap of around 5% of regional GDP, and the private sector needs to meet 60% of that gap. Uh, you see only from these numbers alone how important it is to work on the regulatory environment because if you want to attract large-scale private investment, it cannot happen uh, unless the space within which they will operate is, is predictable. The second uh, element which I find uh, great, of great importance is the north-south vector. I mean, there is a lot of discussion on middle corridor, east-west uh, movement, but I think North-South is uh, just uh, of, of vast strategic importance, not only for, for the countries of Central Asia, but also for, uh, for all of us. Uh, the countries of, of Central Asia are, are landlocked. It's clear that access to the sea is, is critical. There is a massive potential for trade, uh, massive potential for exchange. I have already mentioned that in our partnerships with Japan and India, uh, Central Asia is one of the regions that we want to work on, on together. And then uh, finally, and, and I really, um, I think it's great that, that the, the, the conference is singling this out, the importance of connectivity for resilience and for security. Uh, this cannot be emphasized enough. Um, and, and the uh, managed interdependence really brings huge stability dividends. Uh, I think looking just at the, at the map, it's clear that um, an, an agreement and working together between Central and South Asia uh, with Afghanistan, of course, included, is, um, is something that can produce long-term, um, not only economic growth, but also uh, resilience and, and security for the space. And finally, and I'll uh, wrap up these few remarks here, uh, we really need to use 
the post-COVID recovery in a very smart uh, way. We need to double down our investments on connectivity, on green and digital transition. This is the future. This is also a great chance for developing countries. It can jump a generation of development, if you wish, and nobody can afford to miss it. Um, I hope that the discussion um, in Tashkent will help us understand how to do this uh, in, in the best sustainable way, uh, the most efficient way that we will be looking at both regulatory um, environment that is needed, but also financial instruments that are needed. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the discussion today, but also discussion um, uh, at this conference, which I think is, is both super important and very timely. Thank you. Thank you, Romana Lahutin. Uh, uh, great uh, keywords. I mean, we journalists, we like uh, keywords like uh, stability dividends, huge stability dividends from, from a conference uh, like this, uh, long-term resilience and, and security, um, post-COVID recovery to be done in the right way. Uh, that was uh, the European External Action Service perspective uh, uh, seen from the aspect of uh, connectivity. Now I'm giving the floor to another representative of the European External Action Service, uh, Philippe van Namersfort, uh, who is uh, deputy head of uh, Central Asia uh, Division. Uh, with uh, his perspective, uh, Philippe van Namersfort, uh, the floor is yours. Well, th th thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Gorgi, and thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Romana. No, of course, we, we agree. I mean, this would be a very important event. I mean, uh, this is a very welcome initiative on the side of Uzbekistan. And I would say that this is an important event for, for two reasons. I mean, one, obviously, the conference will help to, to take forward the regional cooperation, the regional conversation on connectivity, but it will also provide an opportunity at this particular point in time to, uh, to reaffirm the support of the international community to the, to the peace process, to a credible peace process in Afghanistan. And at this particular juncture, you will agree with me that this is uh, particularly timely and, and important. And in our view, in the view of the EU, I mean, it is quite important to, to link up Central Asia more closely to, uh, to Afghanistan and vice versa. Um, and that's part of the of the future stabilization and the future for, for prosperity in the in the region. Um, I would simply maybe make a couple of additional points to, to what um, Romana Gorgi and the ambassador have, have mentioned. Um, what I think the, the good news is that in the last couple of years uh, we've seen some new momentum in regional cooperation in Central Asia, uh, in particular led by Uzbekistan's uh, reform process and opening up, and that has generated quite a new new uh, interest in uh, enhancing connectivity, uh, developing cooperation within the region. Um, and we are seeing this happening. Eh? We are seeing steps towards uh, cooperation in customs, trade facilitation. If you look at the numbers, which are quite impressive, the amount of trade between Uzbekistan and its neighbors, I think, has quadrupled in the past couple of years. Um, and there is a growing realization that regional cooperation as such can bring economic and political dividends. And being what we are, uh, of course, we, we want to support uh, all this. Uh, now, of course, um, connectivity remains a challenge in Central Asia. Uh, the region has been quite fragmented so far. Um, and probably it lacks a common vision, a common approach to, to what it wants to see developing in terms of connectivity. There are different, different corridors, different routes, different visions uh, among Central Asian partners. But once again, the, this conference and further steps of the kind uh, would be quite helpful to shape a common vision for the region for connectivity. If you look at a region like ASEAN, I mean, this is, these are countries which have equipped themselves with a common roadmap, 
when it comes to connectivity, and that, that should be the ideal uh, objective at some point in Central Asia. Um, so where, where does the EU stand in, in all this? Well, first of all, it is in our interest to support uh, greater connectivity greater regional cooperation in Central Asia uh, because of the dividends at stake for the EU, uh, the new levels of trust within the region, uh, but also reduced transit times for EU, uh, EU trade, uh, but also the greater attractiveness, I would say, uh, for EU business of a more integrated regional market, a level playing field, uh, which is more attractive than segmented national markets. As Roman has said, the EU has been quite uh, engaged when it comes to supporting uh, better connectivity, intra-regional trade within Central Asia and between Central Asia and Afghanistan. If you look at the total amount of EU development assistance delivered to Central Asia and Afghanistan in the last uh, six years, uh, well, the total amount is 2.5 billion Euros, so that's not negligible. And I'm talking about grants. Huh? Although partners of the region are delivering or giving loans, we, we are delivering uh, grants. Uh, when it comes to connectivity, we've been quite active in uh, cooperation to support border management, to support trade facilitation, transport, energy connectivity. I won't get into the details, but a point I wanted to, to say that when, at the time when Central Asian states are looking for credible alternatives on connectivity to diversify their options, there is a lot the EU can, can bring to that. And I would also say that the uh, EBRD, the uh, EIB, the European Investment Bank, have been uh, supporting uh, projects in connectivity, hard and soft, uh, for a long time. Uh, and if I may say, long before the uh, Belt and Road Initiative existed. Um, voilà. So uh, this will be a very important moment, maybe an opportunity to, to, to give a higher profile to the EU's contribution to connectivity within Central Asia, between Central Asia and its neighborhood, uh, including uh, Afghanistan. And we also want to, to particularly welcome the initiative of Uzbekistan, which has also offered or proposed that we organize next year a dedicated EU Central Asia uh, high level conference on connectivity. And that obviously also would be a key step to, to take forward our cooperation in that respect. Voilà, this is what, what I wanted to, to stress at this point. Thank you very much. I hope I've not been too, too long. Uh, Philip uh, von Amersfoort, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, interesting news, uh, new Central Asia uh, conference uh, next year, probably hosted by Brussels, uh, uh, Philip von Amersfoort, uh, or... No, no, no decision yet. on this, but that, that should mm -hmm. take place next year. Okay, okay, so, so the, the interest is, is there, uh, obviously. And the geopolitical um, aspect, of course, with um, Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan, the timely uh, moment of the conference. By the way, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, striking, uh, uh, because uh, more or less we, we learned about the conference at the time when it was clear that uh, the Western forces are leaving uh, Afghanistan, but... Uh, um, I think uh, uh, Stefania Benalia from SEPS will, 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 will speak more, more about this. Uh, uh, for, for the time being, um, um, I, uh, I will uh, stick to the schedule and uh, give the floor to um, MEP uh, uh, Richard Czarnecki, um, who is a Polish uh, MEP, uh, um, who is uh, from the um, ECR group uh, and uh, who chairs uh, uh, the delegations for relations uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, Mr. Czarnecki, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very much indeed for uh, organizing such a timely uh, event. Uh, from our European Parliament perspective, Central Asia uh, is a region of strategic importance facing a number of security challenges, uh, particularly from growing instability in war-torn Afghanistan. Uh, therefore, for 
uh, therefore the, the European Union has decided to upgrade its uh, engagement in the region. Uh, a high level political and security dialogue involves the EU, Central Asian countries and Afghanistan. Uh, this dialogue uh, led to discussion around the new EU Central Asia strategy, as well as the promotion of EU Asia uh, connectivity. Um, uh, today we are seeing the growing importance uh, of Uzbekistan in Central Asia. The recent uh, political developments in the country have opened the way to closer international uh, cooperation uh, and improve the conditions for investment and economic growth. Uh, being at the heart of uh, Central Asia, Uzbekistan uh, has uh, geostrategic uh, importance uh, for the European Union, for us. Uh, first of all, uh, as a transport and transit hub, which lies at the heart of the uh, Silk Road, Uzbekistan offer a platform connecting the uh, Eurasia with the rest of the world. Um, Uzbekistan's uh, long-term plan to improve rail links between the Central and South Asian countries has already attracted many global financial institutions such as the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and uh, EBRD. Uh, the new transport corridor um, uh, will improve uh, connectivity between Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and further to the states of Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, I believe uh, such a uh, railroad will have three key uh, advantages. First, it will uh, significantly reduce the time and cost of transporting goods between uh, the uh, between South Asia and uh, Europe through Central uh, Central uh, Asia. Uh, secondly, uh, the new uh, Trans-Afghan Railway, which provides access uh, to the three Pakistani seaports of Karachi, uh, Bin Qasim and Gwadar, will dramatically increase the transit potential and cargo flow to Central Asia. And uh, uh, third, the initiative will revive the region's historical role as a connecting link between Europe and Asia through the shortest uh, land road. Finally, finally speaking, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's uh, clear that uh, any uh, connectivity project uh, creates opportunity uh, for ensuring peace and stability in Afghanistan by stimulating growth and job uh, creation. This is essential for the development and exploitation of uh, minerals of Afghanistan, such as copper, tin, zinc, iron, or marble, granite, and travertine. The economic benefits will create a common ground for all forces to work on peaceful settlement instead of endless war. A uh, original consensus built on such realization will prove far more effective than any political agreement or geopolitical deal. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me and your kind attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Czarnecki. Thank you very much for this perspective from the European uh, Parliament, also uh, with a geopolitical angle. Uh, obviously, we will speak more and more 
about uh, Afghanistan in, in the months uh, to, to follow. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Stefania Benalia, um, uh, who works for the Center for European uh, uh, Politics Studies, uh, a well-known Brussels uh, think tank. Uh, Stefania Benalia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe that by now it is quite clear why connectivity is important, why it will make all our life better, why we need to invest into it and how big and stimulating these challenges. So I won't actually comment on this. Plus, actually, after today's discussion and the upcoming summit in Tashkent, there is little doubt about uh, the importance of connectivity. And the recent endorsement of Biden with the creation of the Build Back a Better World initiative during the last G7 summit was really the last push in terms of political capital, which was needed behind this connectivity issue and which must really have convinced the few remaining ones about the importance of investing into connectivity. So what I want to concentrate is on the how. How are we going to implement the connectivity initiatives? How is the private sector going to contribute to it? How are we going to create an innovative financial system that drives the growth and generates returns? Because this is really the key issue, I believe. Connectivity can really be a game changer. The EU is understanding its potential as a foreign policy tool, as it has been reminded, the EU has always known its potential alternative, internally, but as a foreign policy new tool is learning how to leverage and use it just more recently. But it really has to really have an impact. It really needs to be ambitious and transform the way foreign policy is implemented, shifting from taxpayers euros to investment euros. Because right, the way ahead has pretty much two different approaches, a project-based approach and a systemic-based approach. They'll turn the project-based approach, as the name says, is based on projects which are identified and implemented in cooperation with the private sector. The advantage is that it's more immediate, it has the impact which is more immediate, it's easier to implement, and it leaves the private sector in the driving seat. Because, of course, it's always going to be the private sector driving the priorities and setting the modalities. The downside is that it won't attract the bulk of the industry, which is rather interested in a sustainable, long-term engagement. And therefore, the limit the, this approach will limit the impact that connectivity can have as a foreign policy tool for the EU. The alternative is the systemic-based approach, which is this, the approach which I believe is the one that the, that the EU should adopt, which is by far more challenging, but the rewards is definitely worth it. Um, as the name says, it is, um, it's sustainable because it creates a system, is based on creating an innovative financial system that drives the growth and generates the returns. Therefore, the bulk of the private sector would be much more interested in participating in these kind of initiatives because it's interested in long term uh, where the investment generates returns and are supported. The risks are supported in a number of ways. So, of course, this is a riskier uh, approach. But again, uh, that's where the, um, the impact of the EU as a foreign policy actor could really make a difference and it could set the EU is a global actor on a different trajectory. Because let's also not forget that the EU is pretty much learning now how to become a global actor. Because until now, the EU foreign policy, we can have a long discussion about it, but was quite timid. So by changing the relations between public and private sector and the way the public sees and interacts with the private sector and vice versa, you can build that the, really the basis for a different foreign policy, which is closer to its citizen. Because, of course, it has the effect of creating ownership in the private sector, which is citizens, uh, by reaching, which will then reach a common objective. And this is very important in this specific moment for the EU, because, as I said, is really graduating its foreign policy. So to conclude, I believe the EU should really be ambitious and create a new way of doing foreign policy through connectivity, because connectivity really has the potential to make all our life better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefania Benaria. Uh, for me, uh, 
connectivity has been the uh, politically correct uh, word uh, in uh, in the European Union uh, uh, to say, in other words, uh, Belt and Road or uh, the alternative to Belt and Road, and uh, we can discuss this. Uh, but in any case, uh, thank you very much uh, for for your uh, your remarks, and uh, um, we are getting a little bit uh, short of time, and uh, this is why, without further ado, I'm giving the floor to. Uh, Stefan Fule, um, uh, the former European Commissioner for Enlargement, uh, whom I used to uh, to know and to work with very closely, uh, who is now the consultant of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Uh, Mr. Fule, uh, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Georgi. Good morning to everyone. I very much appreciate uh, your active and uh, the Embassy of Uzbekistan taking this proactive role in promoting uh, the forthcoming summit. I will share with you five reasons from my perspective why it matters, and I'll try to be as short as possible. The first reason is that the globalization as we uh, know it is over. Uh, and we are looking for the ways to keep the best from the globalization, but at the same time to avoid the hiccups uh, which we uh, have um, uh, uh, tested during uh, this pandemic uh, uh, time. The second reason why it matters, why it matters for Uzbekistan, uh, not only sort of to remind uh, the historic role of the Silk Road, uh, but uh, I think even more importantly, to show the progress under the President Rezaev when it comes to the reforms and modernization after decades of uh, self-isolation of this country and uh, also the growing positive role of Uzbekistan in regional uh, cooperation. Uh, it matters also because it also matters for the European Union because of our dependence on trade and our dependence on fair competition. Uh, uh, it matters also for the concept of connectivity because it will give us uh, uh, the opportunity uh, to present this broadest meaning of the concept, uh, which is a sustainable, comprehensive and rule-based uh, connectivity, bringing prosperity, safety, uh, resilience and also diversification for those who participate in it. The third uh, reasons why it matters uh, that it will be uh, focused also on Afghanistan at the critical time, it has been mentioned, the time when we leaving uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, militarily uh, uh, to reassure Afghanistan, but also the countries around that they will not be uh, uh, alone in tackling the challenges uh, which are, I'm sure, uh, uh, to come. It's also important and it matters that um, it will be not focused on, on China, that it's not under China's Belt and Road Initiative, because this is not the time to impose anyone's rules on, on how the connectivity should look like. And it's up to be the Central Asia and it's up to be on, on, on South Asia to determine the scopes of, of ambitions uh, here. The fourth reason uh, is, uh, you know, the building road is not an end, it's, it's the beginning. Uh, the connectivity uh, uh, should be seen as a means and not an end in itself. And it offers uh, a number of new platforms to interact uh, with both regions, uh, coming to the strategic alliances between the EU and, and the specific countries or region, to participate in a green reco recovery and to going up to the point of soft integration because all of that the connectivity could bring. And the fifth reasons why it matters, I think it will be one more opportunity to remind us all how important the cooperation among all integration projects on the Eurasian uh, uh, continent uh, is. I'm talking about the European Union, I'm talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and I'm talking about Eurasian Economic uh, uh, Union. We need to tackle the, the compatibility of the regulatory framework of those three integration projects. Otherwise, we create a new dividing lines, uh, this time based not on the military uh, mightness, 
but on a different uh, approaches uh, to commerce and trade uh, uh, and well-being indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan Fule. Uh, very interesting remarks. Uh, thank you for uh, highlighting uh, uh, the opening of, um, uh, of Uzbekistan uh, uh, under uh, President uh, Mirziyoyev, which was a game changer for the region, but uh, obviously uh, it has also geopolitical aspects uh, seen from today's perspective. And uh, uh, for highlighting uh, this issue of uh, compatibility or lack of them, of regulatory rules for the different uh, regional projects that uh, that exist, uh, uh, quite quite a quite a big issue. Uh, la last but not least uh, on my on my list is uh, uh, Dr. Obid Hakimov, uh, Deputy Advisor of the President of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Economic Research uh, and uh, Reforms in uh, Tashkent. Uh, Dr. Obid Hakimov, uh, you have the floor, sir. Good afternoon, dear uh, participants. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, dear participants of today's symposium. It is an honor today to participate in such a symposium and, you know, to give our opinions about this very important event. So if I tell you about the Central and South Asia, we are neighboring regions with a long historic ties and have great potential for expanding mutual cooperation. So the Central Asia, as you know, that with the 75 million population and $300 billion worth of gross domestic product has huge potential and it is growing with a five to 7% annual growth during the last five, six years. So even the, during this tough pandemic times, three out of these five Central Asian countries showed very good growth rates you know, under these uh, hard times. Historically, we know that these countries were part of one big countries and we are part of CIS free trade agreement, zone agreement, and you know that we are trading in this zone. And uh, this new uh, area, which is the South Asia, with 1.9 billion population and more than 3 trillion gross domestic product, could be very good economic partners for Central Asian countries. With the growth of economies and the population of the Central Asian countries, the total potential of internal regional market increases and the mutual trade between the countries and regions increase the investment activities. So according to the Boston Consulting Group, for the next 10 years, next 10 years, Central Asia will be attracting significant amount of investments. And according to their in estimations, it will be about 170 billion US dollars and 40 to 70 billion of them, they are non-resource industries. So if I tell you about the South Asia region, with the full implementation of the, I mean, the, according to the UNCTAD, this region is also very dynamic and vibrant. And UNCTAD World Investment Report notes that in 2019 only, the investment inflows to the South Asia was increasing 10% and it amounted about $57 billion. And 20% of these investments went to India. At the end of 2020, the total trade between the Central Asian countries and the South Asian countries, if you see it, it consisted only by $4.4 billion. So it is the, the uh, trade, uh, it is 3.2% of our Central Asian countries' trade. So as you can see that we don't trade a lot with South Asian countries, but we can show that we have huge potential to grow this uh, number. At the same time, if we look at the comparative analysis of the structure of exports of the Central Asian countries and the structure of the imports of the South Asian countries show that coinciding terms of the, in the commodities only, we can see that South Asia imports the, the goods which we export for the amount of 560 
billion US dollars. Of course, this doesn't mean that Central Asian countries can replace the indicated volume of imports to the South Asian countries. So, for example, the, the South Asia in 2019 only imported chemical fertilizers amount of $8.6 billion, including India for $7.2 billion US dollars. At the same time, all Central Asian countries with their re rich chemical industry exported $384.3 million worth of chemical fertilizers. As you can see there, we have a lots of potential and lots of ways to grow our trade investments. And uh, if, uh, as, as our colleague indicated on the transportation, for example, let's say, if you look at the transportations, the transportation routes also will significantly diminish our export prices. As you know that to building this new railroad, railroad which is Mazar Sharif Kabul Peshawar will reduce the transportation costs from $3,000 per one container to the what $1,400. As you can see that this will be what significant improve or the reduction of the what export costs for Central Asian countries. And one of the main reasons, uh, so this connectivity, uh, importance of this connectivity, we have to show that, you know, connectivity improves when we have very good infrastructure. So this venue, this conference will be also very important that we will show that, we will discuss that how important to discuss about the investments into the future infrastructure. When I say the infrastructure, transport infrastructure, or kind of, you know, the social infrastructure, we know that this connectivity will improve uh, well-being of these participating nations. As you know that just building one highway or the big road or the railroad will reduce the poverty. And we have hundreds of studies which empirically showed that this connectivity, these infrastructures will reduce the uh, poverty rates in these countries. And we know that for the Uzbekistan specifically that we are planning to bring annual volume of mutual trade with Afghanistan also, also only $2 billion by 2023, as well as preparing the signed preferential trade agreement with it. At the present, Free Trade Zone International Trade Center in Termes is being created on the territory of the Termes city with a special visa regime and entry from the territory from the Afghanistan side. Among the investment projects, as we said that, you know, the implementation of the, uh, this construction of the 500 kilowatt power transmission line, Sulhan Pulukumri, will be also very significant step in developing the, you know, the Afghanistan and, you know, the exporting the energy sources from the Central Asia. In addition, the, as we mentioned about already, Mazari Sharif Kabul Peshawar Railway will provide very good transportation roads for the Central Asian countries to go to the what, seaports of the Pakistan. So economically concluding, I have to say that this connectivity is beneficial for all participating members. It is not only beneficial for, for example, let's say Central Asia or the South Asia, it is also beneficial for the development of the Afghanistan or the Pakistan. So as you can see that if you look at the Central Asian countries' trade patterns, we are increasing our trade with the South Asia. And if you look at the trade patterns, we are trading more with the Afghanistan. Why with Afghanistan? Because we have very close distance and we already participated all the built transportation infrastructure to the, to, for the trade with Afghanistan. Similarly, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan also, they all have very good, interesting infrastructure and you know, the economically sensible projects with this connectedness. So for the further discussions, I will tell about these projects, maybe if someone interested later on to, to, to because my time's uh, off already, 
Thank you very much, George. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hakimov. I didn't interrupt you because it was uh, really very interesting, uh, you know, this uh, this perspective. What what I can say from my perspective, you know, as a, as a journalist based in Brussels, is that uh, your country uh, is the double-locked country. There are very few countries in the world that are double-locked. Uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, uh, I mean, land double landlocked. And uh, now uh, the new perspective is uh, is different. It's uh, uh, from uh, landlocked to land-linked countries. And I think that Europe has provided the example uh, many years ago. I mean, uh, if there is a, a double landlocked uh, country in Europe, that's Liechtenstein. And I don't think this is an impoverished uh, country. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, what is happening uh, now in, in, in Central uh, Asia and in the uh, larger region is, is a remarkable development. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, Euractiv is, uh, is, is reporting on, on, on this. Uh, now, uh, I will, some housekeeping. Uh, I would like uh, to remind to the audience that uh, they can send uh, their questions uh, in, in writing, uh, indicating uh, who they are and to whom they are asking the question. I already received uh, one, one question, which I'm going to, to read. Uh, and uh, this one is addressed uh, to all, all the uh, speakers. And also in terms of uh, housekeeping, uh, I, uh, I'm aware that uh, there are some um, European experts present in the embassy of Uzbekistan uh, in Brussels, and uh, they would like to intervene. But uh, first, I will read uh, the question I have received uh, from, from the audience. And uh, all of the panelists are invited to answer it. It comes from Elisabeth uh, Margot. Uh, she asks, uh, what is the thinking between uh, building uh, connectivity in uh, non-EU Asia when uh, Europe grapples with far-right uh, extremism a budding eurozone crisis and pandemic poverty. How can EU uh, taxpayers gain? I have my own answer to this question, but I prefer uh, to uh, to to offer uh, the chance uh, to to the uh, to the speakers, to the panelists, uh, to answer this question. Uh, maybe maybe I should start with a representative from uh, from. Uh, the European Parliament, uh, maybe from uh, Mr. Czarnecki. Um, no, I, Mr. Czarnecki, can, I don't think he... Mr. Czarnecki? No. Uh, okay, uh, Philippe Van Amersdorff, uh, would you like uh, to answer this question? Uh, how can the EU afford the luxury to spend money on uh, developing uh, regional ties in distant regions when we have our own problems? I rephrase the question in my own way. No, thank you very much, Georgi. Well, it is, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is a good question, I mean, basically, uh, but I wanted to actually to, to respond to you also by picking up on the very important points which Stefania made. And basically, because the reference has been made to the, to the EU taxpayers, the point I wanted to make is that support to connectivity in Central Asia, uh, basically uh, the huge amount of money needed, the, the huge amount of money required to promote infrastructure, to improve connectivity in this part of the world, will not come from public money. I mean, the, 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 the needs are so huge that it is very important indeed to achieve our objectives, to, to incentivize, to mobilize um, a private investment. And if you look at it, the EU is the largest source worldwide of private investment, way, way before the US and, and others. So, uh, and these private investments could uh, come and support a lot of good quality connectivity projects in Central Asia, provided that the, the right conditions, the right climate for investments is there. Uh, and what I wanted to, to say is that when it comes to, to the EU, we've developed in Central Asia and elsewhere, but also in particular in Central Asia, a whole approach to try and promote that, to promote the, the conditions 
to attract more private investment and uh, a return on investment in Central Asia. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, we've been supporting with the OSCD um, a very important project to, to promote private sector development, small and medium enterprises in Central Asia. Uh, we've been supporting the WTO accession of countries of Central Asia, including, of course, Uzbekistan. Um, we've been uh, also promoting the rule of law in Central Asia and promoting legal transparency, legal predictability, uh, the fight against corruption. I mean, all this is very important to attract private investment. In a country like uh, Kazakhstan, we have established an EU-Kazakhstan uh, business forum, which provides a platform for EU business to raise all concerns about access to the Kazakh, Kazakh market and all issues relating to doing business in Kazakhstan. We also want to organize, by the end of the year, an EU-Central Asia economic forum that will precisely bring together representatives of European business to discuss with uh, Central Asian business and Central Asian governments to discuss all the obstacles to investment in Central Asia. My point is that there is a lot of potential for generating uh, growth, employment, uh, uh, dividends um, in doing business with Central Asia if the conditions are, are met. And the EU private sector, the EU companies, uh, EU employment could benefit a lot from, from all this. So uh, one aspect also I wanted to, to mention as part of our EU development assistance uh, for the, the coming EU budget cycle, we've also created a new mechanism, a fund, that will precisely aim to, to de-risk, to, to create um, uh, leverage for private investments in Central Asia through guarantees. Uh, once again, the idea is to really try and encourage all this uh, good uh, private investment in Central Asia and elsewhere. So uh, I think we've commented quite a lot on the benefits, the dividends for connectivity. There are benefits to be uh, to be ripped in Central Asia, but also for for the EU. Once again. Central Asia, uh, Afghanistan, that represents uh, a fairly uh, young and dynamic growing market, uh, provided the conditions for, for investment, for doing business with Afghanistan in place, provided peace is there. There, there, is, potential, um, there is potential for, for this in, in very concrete terms for, for the EU. Uh, voilà. Gorgi, this is what I would want to, to, to emphasize at this, at this, at this point. Thank you, thank you, Philip uh, van Amers Fort. Uh, um, uh, does does uh, somebody else uh, from the panelists uh, wishes to answer this question? I mean, why is the EU spending its uh, its money on uh, regional co co cooperation in Central Asia when we have uh, such acute uh, problems um, internally speaking? Uh, Mr. Charnetsky, would you like to? Uh, anybody else? Um, Romana, uh, you have unmuted yourself, uh, yes, but uh, you have the floor. Yes, yes, do you hear me? Yes. Good, great. Uh, there are three, three I'll, I'll be very quick, uh, three main things. Uh, I mean, this is absolutely for the gain of, of the European taxpayers. Uh, first, uh, when you look at the structure of uh, European Union's economic growth, uh, most of it actually happens outside of the EU physical space. So we depend on the stability, resilience uh, and growth in that space. Uh, it is in our inter interest to, to invest in connectivity because we are therefore also investing in our competitiveness uh, outside of the EU, be it on creation of trade routes, value chains, uh, you name it. Second, uh, connectivity is not value neutral. Connectivity comes with rules and norms. It comes with the rule of law. It comes with transparency. It comes with uh, an environment which our businesses need to be able to invest. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, it's really also about supporting resilience and stability of our partners. When you look at different regions uh, beyond also uh, EU Asian space, European Union is always <laughs> number one trade, uh, trade partner. 
in order to be a trade partner, you need that space to be to be sta stable and to be growing. Uh, and I think then finally, um, Stefania really said it all about the importance of uh, connectivity as a geopolitical tool for the for the projection of, of European Union's capacities. And in this specific um, and in this specific policy, we do have all those capacities, and um, I think they uh, really can prove to be, as she said, a game changer for our positioning. Okay, uh, uh, Stefan Fille, would you like to add uh, something, uh, uh, or maybe your yes, will Romana, Romana made a, a very good point. Uh, I think what needs to be underlined that uh, our prosperity, safety, and well-being uh, is very much linked uh, with the trade uh, outside the European Union. And the connectivity is a concept uh, which uh, allows this to happen. The connectivity is the concept uh, how to create uh, uh, a fair competition for our goods uh, uh, to be traded and how actually to have the money uh, uh, the woman has asked uh, uh, to be redistributed within the European uh, Union. Uh, I have received a question from uh, uh, Toman, uh, who identifies himself as expert in geopolitics. Uh, docent uh, Lyon University, Eurocontinent Brussels, and the question reads, uh, for the EU to reach uh, strategic autonomy, uh, build a global strategy at Eurasian level, uh, connectivity thematic is uh, strategic uh, for econom economy and security, uh, as in the case of Afghanistan. So, would it be wise for the EU to have formal relations with Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic uh, Union. Um, so, uh, Mr. Toman didn't say to whom he's asking the question, but I'm tempted to ask the question to the representatives of the European External Action Service. Um, so, uh, please, uh, one of you um, uh, decides to, to answer this question. Filippo Romana. Well, I can try and take this up if Romano agrees. Um, no, we uh, no. There is no uh, institutional relationship or cooperation with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, because on, on several issues our agenda does not really uh, match or converge. Now we have an established working relationship with the Secretariat of the SCO, which is based in, uh, in Beijing, in China, and so there are regular uh, ad hoc uh, contacts. Uh, but on issues like terrorism or terrorism and human rights or others, um, we, we do not really see uh, ourselves as sharing the agenda of the uh, SEO. When it comes to the uh, Eurasian Economic uh, Union, uh, we also do have uh, technical level uh, discussions, regular contacts with the, uh, the Commission in particular of the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, but there is no particular need at this point to, to, to formalize or to... to institutionalize any any form of um, relationship okay uh, i have uh, another question uh, which was uh, asked the by comments which uh, stefan Fuller made about the uh, compatibility of um, different regulatory frameworks i mean this is indeed a very important uh, very important point um, so it is also in our interest and to to develop um, contacts to 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 to, uh, to be on the watch uh, what is going on in these other projects. Um, what I wanted to uh, to mention is that when it comes to China in particular, we have an established working relationship with China on connectivity matters. There is an EU China uh, connectivity uh, platform, uh, a forum where we we discuss uh, our approaches, and and China actually has also been quite keen to to, to learn about the EU's uh, know-how. Uh, China has its own approach to connectivity. Uh, but uh, in many respects, he's also quite keen to, to, to learn from new best practices, from new standards, for the, from the EU way of, of doing things. And, and that's something, of course, that we should continue to, to encourage. May I? 
Um, and I'm extremely happy that Philip has added uh, this uh, second uh, second remark because what's really important is to make some kind of uh, relationship between the integration projects where rules are being developed, uh, agreed upon, and then implemented. I cannot say that about the Shanghai organization, but I can definitely say it about uh, 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 the Euro-Asian Economic uh, Union. I understand the uneasiness of the member states uh, to formalize the relationship between the EU Eurasian Economic uh, uh, Union. But at the same time, uh, I think it's of critical importance uh, to look at the compatibility of the regulatory framework, because if we miss the opportunity at this time, we might find the Eurasian Economic Union later on with its trade and other interests much focus uh, to the east and south uh, rather than uh, the traditional relationship we had uh, uh, years ago. I uh, um, got your message from the previous uh, time you intervened about the compatibility of the regulatory framework. Some people don't like uh, European Union to impose its own. Huh? Uh, they say, okay, why, why yours? Uh, let's let's try ours. But, uh, okay. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, one question which sounds to me in very general terms, but sometimes these questions... Uh, May I? Uh, I'm sorry, Georgi. Uh, yes, May yes, Romana, add, please. Add one sentence, yeah? So there are, there are two things here. Uh, one is about uh, ability to uh, engage in full partnerships, and it really requires convergence on, on key principles. I already mentioned them, sustainability and level playing field. And I already mentioned that we are talking within the framework of G7 on, on all the elements of, of this, these partnerships. The second issue is that, of course, in order to have connectivity, you have to have some level of interoperability. And, and here the, the discussion is in the larger space and it's in everybody's interest to be able to uh, connect on the technical level, uh, and also find a way for uh, all the networks to somehow fit into, into each other. So there, these are two, if you wish, qualitatively different discussions. Uh, I, I don't want to go into detail of them, but uh, we are looking at both, of course, uh, with, uh, with interest. Uh, Philip, you, you would like to, to intervene? Yes, please go. No, no, simply maybe to, 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 to react to one of the, the words you use, impose. I mean, the, the EU does not impose. And actually what the, the countries of Central Asia uh, appreciate in the way in which we, we engage with them is that uh, we, we, we like to forge non-exclusive partnerships. I mean, we are negotiating, as you may know, some new generation framework agreements, cooperation agreements with the countries of Central Asia some of which belong to the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, to the SCO, uh, participate in the Belt and Road Initiative. And I would say that probably this is the, the beauty and the, the value added uh, or the comparative advantage of the EU's engagement in this part of the, of the world, this capacity to, to engage uh, on a non-exclusive basis and, and to avoid imposing any particular vision. Of course, we stand firm to our principles. We've got our principles, our interests. I think it was important to to make that uh, that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have received a message that uh, uh, we have um, uh, a couple of international experts uh, in the embassy of uh, Uzbekistan, and uh, they are uh, willing to uh, to ask questions uh, and make short uh, statements. So uh, I'm willing to to pass the floor to to the embassy of uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, so the, I can see Alberto Turkstrad, but uh, please introduce uh, yourself and uh, uh, if you have a question, uh, please tell us to whom it is addressed. Uh, you, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Georgi, and thank you to the embassy for, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Alberto Turkstra, project manager at the Diplomatic World and also co-founder of the Brussels Uzbekistan uh, Friendship Group. I have two short questions. The first one to Dr. Obeid Kakimov. Uh, 
Uh, I understand that high-level representatives from Russia and China will attend the connectivity summit. So my question is, what is the strategic interest uh, of these extra-regional powers in the summit and the issues that will be discussed? And the second question to either Dr. Benaglia or Dr. Kakimov uh, about the evolving situation in Afghanistan uh, in the context of the withdrawal of the Western troops and the rising instability there. So how do you envisage this will impact the implementation or the cost estimates of the connectivity projects and in particular the trans-Afghan corridors linking Central and South Asia? Thank you. Okay. Okay, who, who would like to answer first? Filip uh, or uh, Dr. Hakimov? Dr. Hakimov, you have the floor. So, uh, uh, regarding to the participation of the Russia and China, I have to say that uh, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, so as you can see that these countries are kind of opening their policies and we are more like multi, uh, we, are, we are more like preferring like multilateral relationship if you look at the uzbekistan uzbekistan right now as a you know the observer of eurasian economic union and we already assessed the, what are the pros and the cons of participating in this uh, you know the economic union from the other side, I have to say that we are a member of you know, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. At the same time, we know that the, the Russia and the China, they are the, kind of, you know, the main members of this organization. So uh, Central Asian participation in this connectivity problem, uh, in, in, in this connectivity, uh, uh, in, in this connectivity with the South Asia will be kind of, you know, the interesting point for the Russia and the China. I'm not saying, I, I don't know about the politically, but you know, I would say that this economically also. So this uh, development of the transportation routes, development of the infrastructure, and you know, the increasing the well-being and the reducing the poverty rates in these regions, of course, will be kind of beneficial for the Russian economy and the, for, the, for the Chinese also. So from this side, uh, regarding to the Afghanistan, uh, you know, we know that, you know, uh, situation is unstable and all this connectivity depends on this infrastructure on this transportation routes so what i think that you know the economic uh, development economic well-being of this country will be uh, one of the main factors of the stabilization so that's why the only economic development and you know the prosperity and the well-being of the population will bring the stability to this region Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone from the External Action Service uh, would like to address uh, the issue? Uh, I also have other questions from the audience. Um, so I'm I'm um, I'm happy to um, to go on with those. Uh, Emily Carl, a project assistant uh, from the Atlantic Council uh, South Asia uh, Center, uh, is asking uh, the question, uh, it looks like a very general question, what are the primary roadblocks to regional uh, connectivity? Um, probably in the context of our uh, conference, I think the roadblocks are geopolitical to say the least, but uh, um you it's uh, it's your call um who would like to answer this question what are the primary roadblocks to regional connectivity between uh, um you you have the floor thank you um I hope I'm not stealing the floor. Um, if I may also, one quick comment about the question on Afghanistan that was addressed to me before, um, before and then I will go, go on the roadblocks. Uh, on Afghanistan, of course, the situation now is uh, complicated to say the least. Um, I would say that the EU would then have to take a decision if they want to become a global security provider, which is a question which is actually an open-ended and there is a question that the EU is asking itself, and I'm referring at this point with the strategy on the Indo-Pacific that they are drafting, 
If the answer is yes, they want to become a global security provider, then uh, Afghanistan uh, is a perfect opportunity to show that the EU can do that as well uh, by providing, of course, a security backing for uh, an economic um, and uh, in, in the context that I described before, you know, so a private sector that wants to invest in the growth of the country. And therefore, the EU should then, um, if the answer to the question to become a global security actor is a yes, then they can be actually uh, an, excellent, an excellent player on this. Now, moving on the question on the roadblocks for the regional connectivity, I would say in one word, communication. Communication, which we know that uh, the problem is quite a, um, an issue of the EU, uh, frankly speaking, because the EU uh, honestly speaks its own language and uh, mostly talks to itself, uh, very brutally said, but uh, um, is still, you know, communicating its priorities and in, in, its intention, its objectives to its own citizens and also to other citizens of its partner countries is still a challenge. So this is, I think, the best opportunity because if we are going to adopt an, in, an inclusive foreign policy, then we need the buy-in of the, foreign, the private sector, as I said before, and uh, the private sector are citizens. So we need to communicate better priorities, intentions, objectives, dialogue with the private sector. And that actually, I would say, would already put the EU um, and regional connectivity in a completely better situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefania. Thank you uh, for uh, your perspective. Um, I would like uh, to uh, invite, uh, uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Dr. Obit Harimov, uh, Hakimov, so, uh, simply saying that you know the roadblocks of this connectivity, I would divide it into the two groups. One is economic, uh, economic, and we I can say that it is tariffs, infrastructure, and you know the cooperation. As you know that you know that between these countries, we have we still have some sort of kind you know the protection of the markets with the high tariffs and the high non-tariff you know the barriers. These are the, one of the main economic roadblocks of this connectivity and the infrastructure. As you know, that the uh, non-existence of the infrastructure between these countries is kind of one of the main economic problem of the connectivity and the cooperation. So we know that we have some resources in some country and we have some another resources in, in other countries and these countries can win only by cooperating together, but we don't know and we don't have these cooperations. Another big group of this, you know, the roadblocks of this connectivity, I would say that it's political. So what I say is mainly it's kind of stability in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are getting near to, uh, to the end of our uh, discussion. Uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, all the panelists uh, for some uh, concluding uh, remarks. Uh, who would like to, to start uh, first? Uh, maybe Stefan Fille would like to start first? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you intentionally, uh, at the beginning, you said you might be asking uh, those who plan to participate uh, in uh, in uh, the conference in Tashkent, uh, personally, what the expectations could be, uh, I could share it with you. So that's my, I know, I know, I know my some three of points, them. expectations, if this is a good They didn't time. react. They didn't react. <laughs> but you are going there. Right? <laughs> uh, first, I, I expect that, that um, one of the outcome would be the first. The outcome would be that the region is not a hostage of some geopolitical games, whether it comes from the Eurasian economy, and whether it comes from China or any other big country or region, that it is the region on its own and it has its own ambition and interest. That's point number one. Point number two, I think it would give the opportunity of the European Union uh, to present its concept about the connectivity, as was clearly said by Philip and, and, and Romana also. And I'm very happy that she's doing that uh, job. 
that uh, the EU's policy is not to impose, it's an offer uh, which uh, is not only about uh, hardware, but also software, and that's the most important. And third, uh, I hope also that uh, it will be a showcase for Uzbekistan or the president uh, uh, himself, so, and that it shows that uh, Uzbekistan has become a main promoter of a regional cooperation and connectivity between the uh, Central Asia and South uh, Asia to the benefit uh, of all. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who would like uh, to be next? Uh, Philip van uh, would you like to make concluding remarks? Well, Gorgia, unless Romana wants to, to, to come in first, I think Romana actually will go to Tashkent. So she may have her own expectations for the conference to, to share. By the way, uh, sure. Romana, can you confirm that Mr. Borrell is also going? Um, I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm not at the liberty, but uh, I hope so. No, I, I said at the very beginning, um, I'm, I'm really um, quite impressed with the ambition and, and full understanding of the importance of this, uh, of this discussion. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to engage with different partners once in, in Tashkent, not only with regional partners, but uh, again, with, uh, with those that we have already sort of put Central Central Asia on the map of our joint efforts. Um, you know, if anybody in the world knows how to overcome obstacles and, and manage interdependence, that's European Union. And I think uh, our knowledge and, and our experience can be of great benefit to the region. Thank you. Thank you, Roman Rakhutin. Uh, Philip, would you like to add uh, your messages to this? No, Georgi, very briefly, I mean, since we talked a lot about the, the private sector, I would just say that, well, we look forward to, uh, to highlighting in Tashkent the, uh, uh, well, to, to propose, to put forward an attractive selling proposal. Um, and so, as, we, as we say, the EU quite, um, frankly, has quite a lot to, uh, to propose, to contribute to, uh, to the future of this part of the, of the world. Uh, and I hope the message will come across clearly in, in Tashkent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Stefania Benaria, uh, your uh, final words uh, in this uh, discussion? Thanks. Uh, very rich discussion and they simply uh, build on what has been said so far. Just add the extra ambition to dare to create really a sustainable and innovative foreign policy which is based on the financial system where the objectives are jointly implemented through the policy as well as projects on the ground, which are carried out by the private sector. So really, let's be ambitious and create a new system, which will really bring um, a big, big value. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hakimov, your final words? So first of all, you know, uh, I have to express my gratitude for such a distinguished, you know, the experts that are interested in our region and, you know, the, this uh, significant initiative of our president, you know, connectivity between the Central Asia and the South Asia will be opening the new doors. And as Stefania said that, you know, this uh, event will be kind of, you know, the opening event for the communication. and. You know, it will be opening door for a further improvement of the well-being of not only Central Asia, but also South Asian populations. And we all welcome you in Tashkent. That's, uh, that's, a, very good, uh, that's a very good conclusion of our discussion. I will add uh, to, to this uh, my own favorite uh, quote. So it's uh, huge stability dividends from such an initiative. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, yes, let's go to Tashkent. Let's let's see uh, what the future holds. Thank you very much for joining this Euractiv event.
and read your active. Bye-bye.